Okay, thank you very much for everyone who still stay with us until tonight, until today. Uh, we just had a quick music break and so we will move on to the next session. This is our uh, afternoon session. Uh, this session is about chronic pain management. We will have three prominent speakers, uh, which are, I think already master in the field of chronic pain. We will have Dr. El van der Han, uh, from Turkey, uh, Professor Eric Wieser from Switzerland, and last but not least is Dr. Christine Engelhardt from Germany. And for this session, it will be led by Dr. Bestadi Sukmono from Indonesia. Dr. Mono, you may start. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session of Indo-Anesthesia. My name is Bestari Sukmono. I will be your uh, moderator for today. Today we have uh, three uh, distinguished speakers and a very good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Elfan Erhan. How are you today? <laughs> you will be the first one who is going to speak uh, in the session. Uh, Thank you. Yes, uh, your topic is chronic pain after surgery. And you're a very regular visitor or a regular speaker for our Indonesia. It's so good to yeah. see you again. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. And I think just to cut the time, uh, you have 20 minutes, I think, uh, 45 minutes. You have 45 minutes for presentation and the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sosilo and his great team uh, for inviting me to this uh, distinguished uh, meeting. It has always been a great pleasure for me to be a part of Indoanesthesia, and I'm ha very happy to be here with all those uh, participants. Today, my topic is about chronic pain after surgery, and uh, I will be talking about this topic. Uh, I will uh, first uh, give a brief uh, definition of it and the risk factors and how we prevent it and how we treat it. Uh, the definition or the recognition of this chronic post-surgical pain dates back to 1999. And at that time, the pain uh, developed after a surgical procedure lasting at least two months duration were the, follow, uh, were the criteria and other causes for the pain should have been excluded and the possibility that the pain is continuing from a pre-existing problem should be explored and exclusion abandoned. And after uh, 10 years, uh, several publications have examined the uh, uh, risk factors and severe acute post-operative pain emerged as an important factor that we anesthesiologists could be able to influence. Uh, however, uh, after uh, uh, about 15 years, the uh, defining pers persistent post-surgical pain is questioned and uh, whether an update is required or not was uh, questioned and the proposed updated criteria uh, suggested that the pain should be at least three to six months duration and uh, significantly affect the health-related quality of life. And uh, this phenomenon has been increasingly recognized and consequently the entity became a separate category in the ISP classification uh, as uh, ICD-11, like chronic post-surgical or, or post-traumatic pain. An inclusion of this entity into the classification of the uh, ICD system will lead to recognition of the significance of the consequences of the entity and will result in a better statistical representation and improved treatments. Uh, prevention and treatment of chronic so post-surgical pain has been 
uh, the subject of many uh, reviews and meta-analyses. And here you see the incidence of the subacute and chronic post-surgical pain after common surgical procedures. The inguinal hernia, thoracotomy, uh, orthopedic surgeries, the breast cancer were, uh, and the limb amputation were uh, the most uh, studied um, areas of uh, surgery and uh, uh, according to the new um, uh, table we see here, which is published in 2019, uh, as you can see, uh, we have other surgeries like C-sections, cranotomy, dental surgery, as well as uh, surgeries after uh, liver and uh, kidney transplantations. And here you see... Uh, that the incidence of severe pain is uh, high in some surgeries and the proportion of neuropathic pain component is increased, especially in the amputation and uh, inguinal hernia, as well as mastectomy and postorocotomy syndromes. This area has also been evaluated in uh, the pediatric population as well, especially in the last 10 years. And uh, accordingly, we see that uh, in this uh, pediatric population, uh, the incidence is about uh, up to 35% after uh, major orthopedic or thoracic surgery. And uh, the scoliosis is one of the most important uh, surgeries in this patient, uh, in this pediatric population. Uh, we also see that after, uh, the, we also see some studies reporting the incidences after outpatient pediatric pediatric surgeries as well, uh, especially after inguinal hernia uh, after, uh, surgeries after this uh, pediatric population. And we see that it is associated with negative long-term consequences, including functional disability, activity limitations, low uh, physical, psychological health, as well as economic costs. Uh, Several authors uh, tried to introduce a model of process involved in the development of this uh, uh, chronic post-surgical pain and uh, the disability. And uh, we see some factors like comorbid patient-related factors, the surgical factors, psychosocial and uh, psychological factors, the genetics, inflammation and nerve damage. And here you can see the pro-operative, intraoperative and post-operative factors in a diagram, and we see that nerve in injury and inflammation are very important, and we can, as anesthesiologists, uh, can uh, perform multimodal preventive analgesia to decrease the incidence of this entity. Uh, here we see the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative factors in detail. Uh, we see that pain moderate to severe lasting one more, more than one month and repeat surgeries. The preoperative anxiety, the genetics are all preoperative factors, uh, whereas the postoperative factors are especially the acute postoperative pain, the risk factors. Uh, every day, thousands of uh, patients are being operated, but not all of them uh, develop uh, post-surgical pain. So why do some patients with intraoperative nerve damage develop chronic post-surgical pain, whereas others don't, is a current uh, research question of all uh, these studies. In, uh, just when, uh, in just last year, a conceptual model of biosocial, uh, biopsychosocial mechanisms for the transition of the chronification is uh, evaluated in uh, post-surgical uh, pediatric patients. And accordingly, you see the uh, diagram, including the promorbid factors like age, sex, genetic profile, and medical factors. And we see the psychosocial factors like emotions, cognitions, and behaviors. And we see that the biological factors where it is epigenetics, endocrine, and inflammatory response all have uh, impacted for the evolution uh, for this chronification. Uh, psychological, behavioral, and social components 
are very important. Uh, so the emotional stress like mood and effect, the fear of pain catastrophizing the sleep and parent and family factors were all uh, listed uh, factors. Uh, and we also see the premorbid factors, which can modulate changes in the sensory and psychosocial processes. And we also see the surgical approach and uh, the changes in the epigenetic, endocrine and inflammatory factors. Uh, now I will take a, a closer look at the psychosocial, genetic, and nociceptive factors in the coming few slides. And here you see that the anxiety, somatization, and passive coping predict pure acute or long-term surgical outcomes. And sleep disruption is a very important factor for individual differences and surgical patients who are not active pain copers, who are anxious, distressed and sleeping poorly are prone to psychological vulnerability and detrimental postoperative pain outcomes. So catastrophizing is a potent predictor. The uh, set of negative cognitive and affective processes related to pain is a potent predictor. So high preparative levels of this is important, uh, especially after some uh, surgeries like spine surgery, breast cancer surgery, and C-section. And we see that recent evidence suggests that catastrophizing uh, may be the principal psychosocial driver for the post-operative pain. And here you see in a review that uh, more than half of the studies reported a statistically significant association between the appropriate anxiety and catastrophizing for the pain chronification after surgery. And uh, we also see the same factors for uh, the for the pediatric patients, like uh, child anxiety, child pain coping efficacy, and parent uh, pain catastrophizing as pre-surgical factors predictive for chronification. Uh, considering the genetic factors, we know that 30 to 70 percent of the variations in the pain experience is explained by genetic factors, and a number of genes have, so have shown associations with acute pain and sensitivity, postoperative pain, and analgesic use following surgery. And uh, the mu opioid receptor gene, as well as uh, the uh, catecholometyltransferase gene are all uh, uh, study genes, and uh, we see that after some certain uh, surgeries, the genotype was associated. Some genotypes was uh, were associated with post-surgical pain intensity. So there are strong indica uh, indications that chronic pain, especially chronic post-surgical pain, are heritable traits. And genetic variation accounts for about half of the variance in pain levels. So genetic advances can enable a major paradigm shift toward personali personalized pain medicine. Another important factor is nociceptive function. And efforts have been made to properly quantify the functional status of the nociceptive function by using different stimuli. And uh, preoperative pain-related functional complaints and the pain response to heat stimulation uh, were the most significant preoperative risk factors for the development of chronic post hyaluronic pain at six months and preoperative diffuse uh, noxious inhibitory control uh, testing identified some risk for the uh, chronification of uh, thoracotomy pain. And here you see that increased uh, sensitivity to the heat stimulation predicted post uh, herniotomy pain after surgery in a study performed to uh, 2010. Intraoperative factors are very important uh, because uh, we cannot uh, change the patient's uh, preoperative factors, the biology of the patients, but anesthesia 
uh, are uh, we as anesthesiologists can modify the type of anesthesia and choose appropriate perioperative medication to decrease this incidence. And we also have uh, important surgical factors like uh, type and place of inc incision, the nerve identification, the nerve sparing techniques, the surgical procedure, the experience of the center surgeon and the center for operation. So in uh, surgeries with high incidences of chronic post-surgical pain, major nerves cross the surgical field. So it's very important that we uh, use, uh, the surgeons use nerve sparing techniques, nerve identification, dissection, and uh, consideration to match inflammation. Uh, intraoperative nerve injury is a significant risk factor, but we know that additional factors are also necessary to determine whether a patient will have a pain, a chronic pain or not, uh, since the nerve injury is followed by a great amount of inflammatory response. Uh, here you see the pathophysiology of uh, uh, the persistent post-surgical pain, where you can see the peripheral pain sensitization and central pain sensitization leading to exaggerated post-operative pain. So we know that nociception can be significantly reduced by descending inhibitory controls and amplified with primary and secondary hyperalgesia at the peripheral and central levels. So pain perception is strongly linked to the immune system because it can be powerfully amplified by the activation of peripheral immune cells associated with peripheral nerves and immune-like glial cells like microglia and astrocytes within the central nervous system. So the immune system is able to precondition the nervous sensory system to feel more intense or longer lasting pain. Here you see the steps of the immune response. Uh, just to sum up, uh, the immune response, we know that the immune response continues months after the distal inflammation has resolved. So with the connection, the pain, the immune system, uh, all are very important for this chronification. Uh, and uh, conclude, the activated microglia lead to increases in levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, and these cytokines contribute to neuropathic pain symptoms by directly sensitizing dorsal horn neurons. The important thing uh, about this is uh, the algesic pro-inflammatory priming can be very important because we have some pro-inflammatory prone, uh, prone patients like asthma, inflammatory bowel diseases, or fibromyalgia. So patients suffering from those diseases might be at higher risk to suffer intense pain and preoperative detection of these prone patients and administration of appropriate uh, treatments might improve the management of the pain chronification. So we know that inflammation and glial cell activation are as important as nerve injury itself, and that the central set sensitization is not only due to nociceptive uh, firing at the time of ne nerve injury. Considering the postoperative factors, acute and subacute postoperative pain are very important. So the pain treatment modalities, considering the type and dose, are very crucial for uh, each individual patient. Uh, some studies have established bit, uh, the association between the intensity of acute postoperative pain and increasing uh, postoperative pain is considered an independent risk factor. So how can we reduce the, uh, this chronification by, uh, op uh, by uh, optimal management? Uh, we know that the single intervention during surgery can only have minor effect on postoperative pain. So uh, the sensitization can occur during surgery and postoperatively as long as there is sensitizing stimulus. So we know that the sensitizing stimulus continues after surgery and must be treated both intra and postoperatively. So the preventive analgesia 
is important uh, where we completely block any pain signals from the surgical wound from the time of incision until the final wound healing. So starting the uh, inhib start starting to inhibit noxish uh, inhibit uh, input and central sensitization as soon as surgery uh, starts is very important and we should continue it for as long as uh, after surgery and uh, pain impulses are uh, strong. So chronic pain is complex, a multifactorial phenomenon involving elements of inflammation, nerve injuries, central sensitization, psychological, psychosocial, and environmental risk factors. So uh, it has proven difficult to identify just a single agent that reliably reduced the incidence of long-term pain following surgery. Uh, however, we should pro uh, provide prolonged, aggressive, multimodal analgesia to reduce the central inflammatory response. And for the multimodal uh, balanced analgesia, we have non-opioids, and states and paracetamol. We have local anesthetics. We can inflate. Uh, we have infiltration anesthesia, peripheral blocks, and central blocks. We have uh, opioids, uh, which can be used systemic or neuroaxially. And here you see an algorithm for the minor, moderate, and major surgeries, uh, where we can use. Uh, we should use non-opioids as well as uh, local anesthetics wherever possible the infiltration, the nerve blocks, and epidural analgesia. Uh, subacute postoperative pain is another important issue because uh, aggressive treatment for patients with severe acute pain uh, and uh, of a neuropathic component one to three weeks after surgery is important. And uh, we see that this phase may be a bridge to transit for the transition from acute to chronic postoperative pain. And here you see on the diagram that uh, the nociceptive and inflammatory stimuli continue. And uh, in the subacute uh, period after discharge from the hospital, the mobilization and other daily activities may increase the intensity of painful insults. So, uh, it's very important that not only acute, but subacute uh, postoperative pain treatment at home is also crucial for the chronification of these patients. Uh, regional anesthesia uh, is very important because uh, a long-lasting continuous nerve block can block the transmission of nociceptive inputs from periphery to the nervous system, and uh, local anesthetics themselves may limit neuronal inflammation and uh, limit the development of persistent postoperative pain. Uh, regional anesthesia also decreases the use of intraoperative opioids, and this is an important issue considering the opioid-induced hyperalgesia. We have numerous uh, clinical trials investigating the potential of regional anesthesia for the prevention of uh, chronification, but we see that the available studies don't show a uniformly positive effect. But we see positive results after perioperative epidural anesthesia in thoracotomy, abdominal surgery, and breast surgery. We can see uh, the advantages of peripheral nerve blocks after breast, knee, and hip surgery. And a in a recent trial, we see the positive results after continuous wound infiltration, or in other words, continuous surgical site analgesia after nephrectomy patients. Here in this uh, systemic review, uh, we uh, see lots of uh, RCTs, but to sum up, uh, epidural anesthesia uh, was effective to prevent post-surgical pain after thoracotomy, and the paravertebral block was reported to be effective after breast cancer surgery. Uh, in this recent trial, uh, a 27 hour continuous wound local anesthetic infusion decreased the incidence of coronary post surgical pain after open nephrectomy compared to thoracic epidural or opioid based patient controlled anesthesia. And here you see the results after one and three months. 
comparing uh, the group with epidural analgesia and control group, and we can see that the uh, continuous uh, surgical site anesthesia significantly reduced the severity of residual pain at one month after surgery and optimized the quality of life parameters three months after surgery. Uh, we, uh, opioid free anesthesia is another important factor because we know although uh, opioids have been the cornerstone uh, of perioperative analgesia, their use in this setting is questioned because of the opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And the mechanisms in this opioid-induced hyperalgesia include the NMDA receptor activation and enhancement of glial inflammatory reactions secondary to tissue injury. So clinically, intraoperative administration of high doses of opioids uh, especially ultra-short-acting remifentanil, are associated with more severe pain intensity, higher postoperative opioid requirements, and enhanced hyperalgesia, both around the surgical wound and at distant sites. And several studies have demonstrated an association between the extent of this enhanced uh, hyperalgesia uh, with the C uh, chronic post-surgical pain after abdominal thoracic and cardiac surgery. So there is a rationale for opioid sparing and even opioid-free anesthesia techniques, especially in high-risk populations. And here you see that in this uh, follow-up study in cardiac surgery patients, intraoperative remifentanil was predicted for chronic thoracic pain in a dose-dependent manner. Uh, considering the perioperative pharmacological interventions, we see that most analgesic drugs may have only minor effects on nervous system plasticity. So, and some studies have focused on the potential beneficial effect of antihyperalgesic drugs like ketamine or gabapentin and pregabalin on persistent postoperative pain. And several of these studies have uh, shown promising results uh, like reduced pain three to six months after surgery. So some drugs uh, may be effective for controlling central sensitization and uh, NMDA receptor antagonist ketamine, drugs that modify functions of calcium channels like gabapentin or pregabalin, the antidepressants, or the sodium channel blocker, blockers like lidocaine, topically or intravenously may are, uh, have been studied. Uh, in a, a review considering those pharmacotherapeutic agents uh, published in 2013, uh, treatment, uh, only treatment with ketamine was found effective when it's used uh, before incision as a bolus and started uh, and uh, continued perioperatively and postoperative for uh, 24 hours as an infusion. Uh, we see that uh, an MDA receptor antagonist, uh, ketamine, is an anesthetic, uh, analgesic, and antihyperalgesic, but also um, uh, can also have anti-inflammatory proper uh, properties. So they are critical in postoperative uh, central sensitization and can reduce po uh, postoperative acute pain and opioid consumption. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, in another uh, meta-analysis, uh, it has been shown that ketamine, when intravenously administered, can reduce the chronification of pain at three to six months after surgery and a subgroup, uh, especially after arthroplasty patients. And in another recent trial, uh, they, uh, they uh, showed a possible role for ketamine already on preoperative opioids uh, when they um, studied opioid-dependent chronic pain patients scheduled for lumbar uh, spinal fusion surgery receiving ketamine uh, or placebo. And after the uh, first day, uh, postoperative morphine consumption was reduced and uh, patients in the ketamine group had uh, significantly better outcomes at six months. Uh, gabapentin and pregabalin are other uh, agents, antihyperalgic agents, uh, binding to uh, calcium uh, voltage gate calcium channels, and they are a first-line treatment for chronic neuropathic pain. 
And they, uh, numerous studies showed that they can reduce acute postoperative pain intensity and can be used as a part of multimodal analgesia regime. Uh, but however, their use has been questioned recently because of the uh, safety concerns, especially increased risk of respiratory depression when combined with opioids. But in, ge uh, but, uh, in most of the studies, pregabalin has been shown to reduce the risk of neuropathic uh, post-surgical pain, uh, but we need further studies to clarify the point, especially considering the safety issues. Uh, here in this uh, meta-analysis, uh, combine uh, the uh, prevention of chronic post-surgical pain was evaluated uh, considering gabapentin and pregabalin, and uh, the uh, authors concluded that it can support that uh, purpose of administration may be effective. Uh, but uh, this study uh, pre performed uh, in uh, total knee arthroplasty patients, we see that when pregabalin is started before surgery and continued for a 14-day uh, interval, they can decrease the incidence of neuropathic pain at three to six months. But the authors also draw uh, attention to the point that, the do uh, however, in the doses tested, it was associated with a risk of postoperative sedation and confusion. So it's very important to balance the uh, advantages or and disadvantages of each drug. But uh, for uh, especially high-risk patients, uh, the, the pregabalin can be used at least two hours prior to surgery and should be continued postoperatively till two weeks to obtain uh, a, a good results uh, for the chronification of uh, post-surgical pain. Uh, Antidepressants are another uh, group of uh, group uh, for uh, chronic for the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain, and the role uh, of their uh, the, their role in the prevention of acute and persistent pain after surgery has been studied, but only uh, venlafaxin showed a positive effect with a reduction in movement evo evoked pain intensity after brain cancer surgery, both compared to placebo and the active comparator gabapentin. Uh, here you see uh, the antidepressant drugs uh, uh, where 15 studies were evaluated and only three were uh, included in the uh, in the review, and uh, we see that only uh, venlafaxin is uh, considered effective uh, after uh, breast surgery. And uh, here you see uh, that uh, it uh, was effective uh, till six months, and uh, gabapentin had no effect on chronification, uh, especially decreasing the incidence of burning pain. So we can say that most of the available literature at the moment does not support the clinical use of antidepressants for uh, chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, lidocaine is an amid local anesthetic, and we know that it's analgesic, antihyperalgesic, and can also have anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And it, was, it has been widely studied as a part of multimodal uh, analgesic regime. And uh, into the Grigoras was the first to show that intravenous lidocaine re reduced the incidence of uh, chronic uh, post-surgical pain after breast surgery. And other trials uh, have uh, compared lidocaine with other agents and uh, show uh, favorable results. So the available literature suggests that intravenous lidocaine can help prevent uh, chronic post-surgical pain after specific surgical uh, uh, procedures. So uh, to sum up all those uh, pharmacological interventions, we see that perioperative ketamine is the most studied drug and shows preventive effect 
perhaps in uh, subgroups of patients like chronic pain or opioid dependent patients and then those subgroups can be the main uh, benef- uh, the, the most important groups for the bene- that may benefit from its use uh, small trials have also shown a preventive effect for thoracic epidural analgesia and intravenous lidocaine. We see a potential preventive effect of opioid-free uh, anesthesia. And uh, we uh, can see that as both uh, under or over treatment of subacute postoperative ca- pain can have negative consequences. So uh, we should uh, set up dedicated structures to manage our patients beyond the immediate postoperative period, especially after distru- discharge uh, during their uh, uh, interval at home. Uh, considering the chronic post-surgical pain, uh, the treatment of it after established, we see we can use medical uh, treatments, uh, physical and interventional uh, treatments for this. Uh, since it's a, it's mostly a neuropathic uh, pain, we can use antidepressants, anticonvulsants, topical agents, opioids, especially tromadol, which has a dual mechanism. Uh, uh, physical uh, ter- uh, physical measures are important uh, for those patients with chronic pain. And interventional techniques like regional blocks, somatic or sympathetic blocks, uh, radiofrequency techniques, uh, and spinal cord stimulation are the interventional uh, modalities for uh, uh, intractable uh, chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, here uh, we, you see our uh, treatment as a whole. Uh, the physical treatment can uh, be applied to all uh, stages. Uh, the regional blockade, including somatic blocks, sympathetic blocks are very important. The radiofrequency techniques are used whenever necessary. Steroids can be combined with local anesthetics during the uh, blockade. And uh, we see spinal cord stimulation and intratical opioid in very intractable uh, pain situations. Uh, this is a schematic representation of multifactor nature of neuropathic pain. We see that we have some agents for peripheral sensitization, uh, for central sensitization, and for descending modulation, as well as pain perception and amplification in the upper, uh, uh, upper nervous system. Uh, so, uh, the, for the treatment of established chronic post-surgical pain, uh, we know that chronic pain is a complex condition with significant negative consequences of the patient's level of, of activity, quality of life, cognitive abilities, social and emotional functioning, and financial uh, resources. A biopsychosocial approach to understanding and treating chronic pain is recommended, and multimodal, multidisciplinary rehabilitation programs are uh, associated with best outcomes, but the available randomized controlled trials uh, are uh, very uh, few. Uh, so uh, we should, uh, uh, here we see, uh, especially those uh, trials are after spinal surgery, amputation, breast cancer, and we see pharmacological agents, physical, surgical, uh, psychological, and other pain management techniques. And uh, most trials tested here uh, are um, uh, uh, there are heterogeneity between them, and the results are not encouraging. Uh, so most studies uh, had significant methodological uh, limitations. So uh, for no intervention, there is a sufficient data to conclude on an effectiveness and safety. So that uh, uh, comes uh, that uh, shows us we need more uh, trials uh, testing those multimodal and multidisciplinary treatment pro- programs. And here you uh, see the systemic review of management of chronic pain after surgery, uh, which uh, concludes that there is a need for more evidence about the interventions for chronic uh, post-surgical pain. 
Uh, in recent randomized uh, placebo-controlled uh, trial, patients in the uh, we, uh, we see uh, a recent study where lidocaine, uh, a topical uh, plaster for 12 hours every day for eight weeks were uh, used and uh, reduced pain scores and improvements in quality of life. And we also have several case series, uh, a pi uh, several pilot studies uh, documenting some encouraging results from the use of novel ultrasound guided blocks after breast and abdominal surgery. But here you can see that the patients, uh, the uh, uh, these are only case series and our pilot studies. So uh, it's uh, so we need uh, more um, uh, more studies with uh, different uh, populations after different kinds of surgery. Uh, can, uh, for uh, Initial patient assess assessment is very important. Clinical examination uh, is uh, important to determine the sensory dysfunction in these patients. And uh, uh, we come uh, to the conclusion that there remains a lack of evidence for the treatment of uh, chronic post-surgical patients. Uh, so we need high quality trials of multimodal interventions matching to pain characteristics. So, as a conclusion, chronic post-surgical pain is a complex biopsychosocial phenomenon that once initiated is uh, very difficult to control and difficult to treat. Uh, blocking or limiting persistent pain sensitization post-surgery is uh, clearly important in the prevention of persistent post-operative pain. So for anesthesiologists, some available drug candidates, including multimodal pharmacological approaches, should be combined preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively to limit the nociceptive uh, induced uh, pain sensitization as much as possible. And accordingly, further well designed control clinical studies are needed to firmly evaluate the beneficial effects of different strategies to support anesthesiologists in preventing persistent post-operative pain. Uh, to achieve more efficient prevention of chronic post-surgical pain, we need to better identify the patients at risk, we need to tailor the interventions to their risk factors and improve management of sub subacute pain by following our patients be beyond the immediate post-operative period. Uh, as evidence for treatment options for established chronic post-surgical pain is extremely limited, we need high-quality trials of multimodal interventions matched to pain characteristics. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you for your attention. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we won't uh, be able to have a photo like this uh, for the 18th Indonesia. But I hope that we, I will meet with all of you uh, in the upcoming Indonesia meetings. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I won't have that pictures with you anymore. <laughs> 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 okay, I hope you stay safe. And Thank there you. are a few questions in the Q&A uh, okay. column. You can answer it. Some of them are in Indonesia, but uh, we'll uh, answer it live if we have uh, time at the end of your session. And it was a very interesting topic. Indeed, it is a very uh, comprehensive presentation from you. And I'm Thank going you. to give you a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And the so, next one, uh, we're going to proceed to, and you have uh, approximately spent 45 minutes, and uh, I think we're going to move on to the next uh, speaker. Yeah, yeah. You can answer it in the background. Uh, okay, thank you. And the next one is Professor Eric Busher. How are you? Can you, Professor Busher, can you, re can you hear me? Uh, Eric. Hello. Hello. Yes. yes. I understand that you have a, diff a faulty camera. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't seeing you live. But but you can hear me, can you? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Thank I you very much. For the faulty camera. Yes, it's it's okay. It's very 
I'm very happy to hear you and I I you can uh try the sc- screen share first just to be caution. Yeah, I think I've done that. Okay, uh can we see that? C- can you see the slides? I've not. Oh, hang on. Okay. I did the screen <laughs> share. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, our next Uh, speaker i'm going to introduce you, though we don't need no further in, uh, introduction this is professor eric busher he is a very good friend of uh, indo anesthesia and he's uh, very active in the chronic pain uh, field especially in the spinal cord management uh, and today his presentation is about spinal cord management for the treatment of chronic pain still align with the presentation from Dr. Alfan Erhan about the chronic pain after surgery. And yes. <laughs> yes, yes, we can see. Yes, we can see the slide. We're very happy to. And Professor Eric, you have 45 minutes and it will begin after you click the display slides. The time is yours. Hello. Okay, you you can you can actually click the play slides. Dr. Eric, can you hear me? Can you hear us? We're not hearing anything from you. Okay. I think he's not he's breaking up. Yes, he's not here. Okay, I think while waiting I for we can, I think we, we can, can move on to this yeah. uh, the third session first while we're working on uh, Dr. Eric's presentation. The third speaker, unfortunately, she cannot be here with us in person, but she has already sent uh, her video. It is Dr. Kristen Engelhardt from Germany, uh, and she's going to talk about update in neuroanesthesia, and we're going to listen to it uh, live in video. Uh, you can actually type the questions. If you cannot type it in English, it's okay. You can type it in Bahasa in the Q&A session, in the Q&A column uh, in below. And we'll try to forward the questions to Dr. Uh, Kristen by email. And it would be best if you uh, insert uh, at your email address under the question so we can reply it to you uh, personally. Okay. And since we're not hearing from Dr. Eric, yes, so we're going to play the video. And the host, can you please start the video? Okay. What is most important okay, the, the background, the background found is that the brain, the tissue, is surrounded by a very rigid skull. So any increase in cerebral blood volume in the brain is leading to an increase of intracranial pressure. And this is then leading to a herniation and therefore the surgeon cannot uh, really access his surgical side, which might be here, for example. <clears throat> If the intracranial pressure is increasing more, then you have exp- uh, cerebral ischemia, because no blood will uh, be able to enter the, inter- uh, the, the, the brain, because the pressure in the brain is too high. So the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the pressure which is driving the blood into the uh, brain, is the mean arterial blood uh, blood pressure minus the intracranial pressure. And if the intracranial pressure is too high, the CPP is going down. 
so there is no blood if you have an inc uh, too high intracranial pressure. Why can it happen? Why is it uh, during an operation, why can there be an increase in intracranial pressure? One reason might be that the cerebral blood volume is increasing because possibly the patient, patient had stress and they have a hypermetabolism and this is uh, dilating the vessels and thereby increasing the cerebral blood volume. Another possibility that there is some inter intracerebral uh, hemorrhage or subarachnoidal hemorrhage or something or a sub subdural hemorrhage uh, caused to, to the, the operation. There's also the reason sometimes that there is a problem with the blood brain barrier and that we have a swelling due to cerebral edema. And there is also the possibility that the uh, liquor is not really um, leaving the brain, so we have a uh, impaired liquor drainage. This is also increasing the intracranial volume here. So this is what we want to avoid and treat, and this we always have to have in mind in during neuroanesthesia. What kind of uh, anesthetics can I give? It's first the uh, idea of balanced or intravenous anesthesia. Here you have only uh, have inhalational anesthetics uh, given through the lung uh, combined with uh, opioids, but you also can have only intravenous uh, 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 drugs like propofol combined with an uh, opioid. You can also have the awake craniotomy. There are, will also uh, have a few, few slides for this and uh, you can have the scalpel block, scalp block. So the choice of anesthetics is very important um, uh, because uh, you can, uh, the anesthetic agent should in any way avoid an increase in cerebral blood volume or is thereby increase in ICP. It should avoid a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. I, uh, as I uh, showed, uh, talked to you before, is that the cerebral perfusion pressure is the uh, difference between mean arterial blood pressure and intracranial pressure. And if the intracranial pressure is too high or uh, the mean arterial blood pressure is going down, then we do not have enough cerebral perfusion pressure. This is a very important mechanism you have to remember. Low mean arterial blood pressure, high ECP is reducing cerebral perfusion pressure and anesthetic agent should not interfere with it. The reduction of perioperative stress uh, should be granted. Uh, the uh, uh, patients should awake very immediately after the operation because the neurological assessment after an operation is very important for the detection of postoperative complications. So it should not incre increase the incidence of postoperative nausea and vomiting because the retching with vomiting is increasing the ICP and thereby can lead to intracranial bleeding and it should have no influence on the neuromonitoring you have to do uh, during the craniotomy. But first of all, I would like to talk about the inf effect on the cerebral blood volume. And here we have a study using sevoflurane and propofol for, uh, for patients. And uh, it's uh, here you see the blue and the red, um, uh, the blue and the green areas, and this is a decrease in cerebral blood volume compared to a baseline without propofol. And these are uh, comparable depth of anesthesia. Both have a bit of forty, and you see that propofol is able to decrease even the cerebral blood volume. How is it doing? It decreases the cerebral metabolism and thereby it comes to a vasoconstriction and then we have a, a reduced cerebral blood volume. The same thing you can say sevoflurane is also decreasing the blood uh, metabolism. Yes, it's also at the, in a very low concentration, also decreasing the cerebral blood uh, vessel diameter, but then there is a direct vasodilating effect of sevoflurane and then this counteracts these uh, normal vasoconstriction. 
So we have a neutral effect here and isofluorine and desfluorine in, uh, indeed do increase the cerebral blood volume due to the direct vasodilatatory effect on the cerebral vessels. But sevoflurane is quite suitable for, uh, for this intervention because it does not increase the cerebral blood volume, it doesn't affect anything. So propofol, if you have a high intracranial pressure, high intracranial blood volume, prefer the propofol because it's really decreasing the intracranial blood volume, so it relaxes the brain, though the surgeon has a better access to the operation field. If it's not so important, then you can have sevoflurane. Don't. So, there was also a study comparing uh, meta analyses of 14 different studies comparing propofol and volatile anesthetics for craniotomy, and it was obvious that the ICP was lower and the CPP, or the cerebral perfusion pressure, was higher with propofol. It was, they were observed less moderate brain herniation with propofol compared to sevoflurane, and and perioperative complications, they have been pretty much the same for both uh, anesthetics, but only with the exception of uh, uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting. And this is uh, clear because chronotomy itself is increasing the risk for PONF. And uh, then if you add an inhalational anesthetic, which by itself is also increasing PONF, this is definitely a trigger for this uh, unpleasant uh, event after operation. But there will have been no further differences. So uh, there have been also not in inadequate data to perform a meta-analysis in terms of clinical outcome, whether the clinical outcome is better with propofol or volatile anesthetics. This is a too big uh, outcome parameter, so they couldn't say. So propofol is decreasing ICP and uh, is and we have less burn, uh, brain herniation and a, a, a more relaxed brain with the propofol. So now the time until there's a pharmacokinetic, the time until the patient can open the eyes or can be extubated, this is pretty much the same for both anesthetic agents. Here the dotted line is the propofol, the uh, thick line is the sevoflurane. This is the time of uh, the amount of patients which are uh, uh, open their eyes after a special um, a time. So there is no difference between both. And also the time to extubation. Uh, there's also no difference between both anesthetic agents. So in kind of, uh, in regard of uh, pharmacokinetics, they are really comparable. This is a so-called evoked potential. Here it's a transcranial motor evoked potential, but there are also some uh, somatosensory evoked or acoustic uh, evoked po uh, potentials. This is always a trigger. And then you have this answer and the answer, the amplitude and the time until the answer comes and the amplitude of the answer is uh, saying that is telling you how intact the structure is which you which you want to protect, which you want to control using these uh, evoked potentials. So this uh, Dr. Maisharek, he compared propofol with uh, desfluorine, also the same depth of anesthesia nearly. And with propofol, you have this nice answer to the evoked potentials, while with desfluorine, you have a very suppressed signal, which is not good because here you don't see any further suppression due to an operation, to the operation. So, and if they switch from desfluorin to propofol, the signal was restored again. So, obviously, inhalational anesthetics do suppress the uh, uh, reaction on an evoked potential. So, we can summarize this uh, propofol and volatile anesthetics. So, in terms of cerebral blood volume, that it should not decrease, that the ICP should not decrease. Propofol is definitely the better solution. Then pharmacokinetics uh, is comparable for both uh, in, uh, anesthetic methods. Then we have the uh, nausea and vomiting postoperatively. This is also less with propofol. And then the electrophysiological monitoring is also better with uh, propofol because the volatile anesthetics suppress the signal. So 
can I never use those uh, inhalational anesthetics? Oh yes, you can. We do it quite often because many of the patients are uh, preoperatively f uh, totally normal. They have a normal ICP and they have an uncomplicated surgical approach, not so f so deep in the brain. So this is no problem. You should use your uh, TIVA when you have a preoperative neurological deficit, an elevated ICP, a complex surgical approach, very deep uh, surgical site in the brain. The uh, surgeon needs a very relaxed brain, conflict in the history, or the need for electrophysiological monitoring. Then TIVA is a choice of the anesthetic agent. What you do not, uh, what you never should use is, is nitrous oxide. It's, uh, in, in our hospital we do not use it since 20 years because it has a lot of side effects, but especially in neuroanesthesia and especially in craniotomy, it is proven that it is increasing the ICP. The heart rate was is the same, the arterial blood pressure was the same. When you add the nitrous oxide, you have an increase in intracranial pressure. So avoid this, uh, uh, this, this gas. Now we change from total sleeping intubated patient to an analogous sedation for awake craniotomy. When do you do this? You do the awake craniotomy in a patient with a tumor rich, where the tumor is very close to the eloquent areas, speaking, calculating, understanding words and so on. So a tumor resection, you want to uh, resect most of the tumor, but you do not want to hurt these very pivotal uh, areas for the patient. So you can uh, test the patient and let him talk, let him calculate something while you stimulate the areas which you would like to, res uh, to, to remove. And if he cannot, uh, during the stimulation, if he cannot uh, speak or calculate, then you know you should leave this brain uh, part in uh, this tissue in the brain. You can also use it for deep brain stimulation, possibly for the Parkinson's disease, or meanwhile, there are a lot of other possibilities where you can uh, use a deep brain stimulation. The anesthesia can be a monitored anesthesia care, which means that you give him some sedation and you are close to him, but there is no real anesthesia. You can do the sleep or wake asleep uh, concept that the patient during the chronotomy sleeps, then you wake him up, you, you do the, perform the operation, then you can decide whether he should sleep again or be awake. So complications, there are obviously many because you cannot control the patient. There is sometimes agitation, sometimes arterial hypertension. Uh, there you can give some drugs, but uh, with hypercapnia, hypoxia, it's if you really treat the pain or the agitation or the fear, then you have also the risk of uh, decreasing the, um, the respiration and then you have a hypercapnia, which we mean now know is dilating the vessels and then you have an increased ICP again. The pain sometimes, the patient can feel sick due to excitement, due to the surgical intervention, and if they vomit, then there's always a, a risk of pulmonary aspiration. So um, I think the best thing you should do is to take care of the patient. Um, and uh, you can use propofol and remifentanil and a skull plot, which is meanwhile the standard. But you can also use inhalational anesthetic during the sleeping time, but it's not optimal due to elevated ICP and PONF. So um, when you replace, try to, as a studies replace, try to replace the propofol by dexmedetomidine, this was not a good idea. This increases the side effects. But if you replace the uh, remifentanil by dexmedetomidine and combine this then, dexmedetomidine with propofol, this seems to work quite well. It might, might be the future for, cry, uh, for uh, anesthesia concept for uh, with craniotomy. So um, the most important thing, in my opinion, is the close and empathic interaction with the patient because he is, has fear, he thinks possibly this is not normal, what's happening to me. He might uh, experience pain in the neck and everything because he's so so contracted and so, so tense. So if you talk to him, 
if you uh, make him clear that everything is normal, if you can calm him with your voice, with your talking, with the things you say to him, then I think this is a real, really good thing and this is very good for the patient. So you use a scalp block but, uh, for the uh, awake craniotomy, but you can use the scalp block for also for other things. Uh, you can add a TiVo or a balanced anesthesia, then you, um, then you have less need for opioids. You can also use it for brain, as the brain stimulation, stereotactic procedure, or in children for uh, craniosynostosis repair, which is also a very huge operation in these small children, and there you can also say uh, spare some uh, opioids. This is how it is performed. The patient is within this uh, with, in this um, clamp, and uh, there you have the sites where the, the, the uh, regions where you have to infiltrate your uh, local anesthesia, uh, and these are the regions. And you see easily that the landmarks are quite clear, and that it's not very difficult to put here your uh, anesthetic agent. So now we know how to uh, let the patient sleep so uh, or to, uh, have him awake during anesthesia without pain and fear. But very important in all your patients, but most important in the patients in your anesthesia and craniotomy is that you take care of your physiological parameters because these influence directly the outcome of the patients and uh, the, brain uh, the integrity of the brain tissue. What are the six uh, physiological parameters? Best thing, the six ends. What what should I keep normal? I should maintain obviously a normal volumia, a normal tension. So this means a zero perfusion pressure between sixty and seventy, a normal capnia. So you have to adapt your respirator to have a arterial carbodiacid tension of between 35 to 38, but remember not too low, not below 8 to 30. And a uh, normoxemia, normoglycemia, very easy to take the blood sugar concentration. It shouldn't be lower than 110 because you don't uh, control it so tightly. So uh, please don't go too too deep because then the uh, mortality is increasing but if you go to high mortality is also increasing so this is uh, the perfect uh, region where it should be and there is also a normal thermia where you should be uh, hypothermia is not uh, useful even not during aneurysm surgery or something in the neuroanesthesia craniotomy so don't use the hypothermia don't let the patient be hyperthermic because it's also bad having normal thermic to maintain the normal volume, uh, uh, normal volume, you need to infuse, infuse uh, fluids to the patient, and there it is very, very important to recall the anatomical background because we have in the brain uh, capillaries <coughs> these tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier. This means that ions cannot pass through the barrier here. So in the periphery. Only proteins cannot pass the barrier, the endothelium, but here now the ions also did not, cannot. So in the periphery we have the proteins are uh, holding the water in the vessel, so the uh, oncotic pressure is uh, driving the water, but uh, here the osmotic pressure. This is very important. The high osmotic pressure here in the vessel is withdrawing water from the brain tissue into the water and vice versa if you have a, a hypovolemic uh, concentra a hypertonic concentration here water is going into the brain and leading to brain edema and this is what you really don't want. To avoid uh, this you should avoid uh, the uh, hypotonic solutions. So you can have isotonic crystalloids, you can have isotonic or hypertonic colloids, however the hypertonic colloids, uh, the colloids are a little bit uh, discussed whether they should be used because they might possibly lead to uh, renal insufficiency 
Um, if you use one or two, I think that will be not a problem during an operation, but you should avoid it at size C. And there's restricted indications for the uh, ringer lactate solution and also the albumin and the glyphondin because these are partially a little bit hypo or smaller. You can give one liter from the ringer lactate, but you shouldn't give more. And you shouldn't give at all the 5% glucose concentration because when the glucose is metabolized, then you have free water and this is directly diffusing into the brain tissue leading to brain edema. So what would you do now if your surgeon says, okay, there's a brain herniation, the brain is too tight, the ICP is too high, please do something. What can you do? First of all, you should talk to your surgeon and say whether uh, there is any possibility that the head position can be optimized. Why is that? Because if you turn your head, you obstruct here the venous drainage and then it's uh, it's uh, not really a good drainage and there, so you have an increased blood volume due to this this uh, stop in the in the in the brain drainage and then you have the uh, increased intracranial blood uh, volume and an increased intracranial pressure so uh, the next would be a mild hyperventilation though easy to do you can uh, turn the uh, frequency of your uh, ventilator a little bit higher so the co2 is going down however not too low the arterial uh, co2 shouldn't be below 30 because as i told you before this will lead to a vasoconstriction and then you have a cerebral ischemia you have a nice scp but you have no blood in your head and there's no uh, oxygen for your uh, nerves so so don't exaggerate the co2 dear colleagues i'm very delighted what is most important in your anesthesia in craniotomy is that the brain, the tissue, is surrounded by a very rigid skull. So any increase in cerebral blood volume in the brain is leading to an increase of intracranial pressure. And this is then leading to a herniation and therefore the surgeon cannot uh, really access his surgical side, which might be here, for example. <clears throat> if the intracranial pressure is increasing more, then you have uh, cerebral ischemia because no blood will uh, be able to enter the, uh, the, the, the brain because the pressure in the brain is too high. So the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the pressure which is driving the blood into the uh, brain, is the mean arterial blood, uh, blood pressure minus the intracranial pressure. And if the intracranial pressure is too high, the CPP is going down. So there is no blood if you have an inc uh, too high intracranial pressure. Why can it happen? Why is it uh, during an operation? Why can there be an increase in intracranial pressure? One reason might be that the cerebral blood volume is increasing because possibly the patient, patient had stress and they have a uh, hypermetabolism and this is uh, dilating the vessels and thereby So, all right, I think we will move. <laughs> there are some connection problems. <laughs> I think we'll, uh, Dr. Eric, are you available? Can you try the screen sharing? No. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. do you want to try? Right. Yes. Um, here we go. All right, yeah. Yay. Yeah, and Perfect. then the slides. You can select the yeah, that one. The, yes. The slide. Okay. Yes. 
Okay, so okay, with Eric. All right, fantastic. Forty-five minutes. Thanks so much. Uh, yes. Probably a bit shorter. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks, thanks so Take much for the invitation. Thanks to Cecilio C- and, and the whole team. Um, it's it's unfortunate that we have to meet over the internet, but uh, that's uh, how it is. Um, you may notice that you can't see my face. This is because I have a camera problem. Uh, one more problem. What, what we're going to try to discuss today is um, spinal cord stimulation for, particularly for neuropathic pain. This is the hospital where I'm working, which is in the area of Lausanne and Geneva. And these are my disclosures. The, my department has received funding from the Swiss National Foundation, the Commission for Technology and Innovation, as well as for Medtronic. Uh, I'm doing some uh, speaking and consultancy, consultancy work for Medtronic, but I have no financial uh, interest in, in, the, in the company. Now, um, the initial observation with spinal cord stimulation was that it does relieve neuropathic pain. However, it does not relieve nociceptive pain. If it, if it, is, if it is to be effective, it should be uh, in area where the sensory uh, modalities are not lost. So if you have lost sensory modalities, the initial, and the initial idea was that spinal cord stimulation would not be effective. And then um, because you produce uh, paresthesia, those paresthesia should be distributed in the area of the pain. Now, these are the initial um, concepts. Uh, For instance, here, if this is the area of pain this gentleman is suffering from, well, if you do have um, if you do have stimulation, you should stimulate the air, this area in order to get pain relief. The principle, the dogma is that no paresthesia means no pain relief. Now that dogma has been challenged in many ways in the more recent literature. First, it's known by, by um, a work from um, from uh, Walter Tillmans that um, since uh, 2012, you can produce pain relief with stimulation that you do not feel. In other words, sub-threshold stimulation. It has a, me- a measurable effect. Uh, now, the other thing is that pain relief is not necessarily linked to paresthesia. You do have people who have uh, paresthesia but no pain relief or the other way around. And that one thing that has been confirmed in further studies is that the uh, intensity of the electrical field that you're delivering to the spinal cord is probably one of the key, the key questions. Um, now, you don't need uh, paresthesia. And this is something I suggest you have a look at. Uh, it's, it's already an old paper, you see, 2008, where um, the authors looked at the perfusion of the foot. This is five minutes after 10 minutes, eight minutes, and 20 minutes after spinal cord stimulation. You see that progressively, this ischemic foot is getting more um, perfused. Inter- interestingly, if you do the same experiment with, with sub-threshold uh, um, stimulation, in other words, stimulation that you do not feel, you get the same result. And, and you do have the same observation in the hands. So again, this is one of the first observations that suggests that you do not need to have paresthesia in order for your uh, stimulation to be effective. Now, paresthesia-free stimulation has been a battlefield for quite a number of years now. The companies have 
been trying to persuade you that uh, you know this or that modality of stimulation uh, is better than the other. You have the high density, you have the high frequency, you have burst stimulation. All those modalities are to some extent paresthesia free. Now uh, the 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 reality is that. Uh, they all have shown either better, similar, or worse uh, results than the conventional stimulation. And that was depending primarily on the type of pain um, to some extent, but to a very large extent to who's the uh, sponsoring manufacturer. Because the, 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 unfortunately, the... the um, the literature, literature we have in, on, on the subject is uh, very much biased by uh, economical interests. So I, I think it's fair to say that today there is not one system that trumps all the others. There may be systems that are more ap appropriate to some indications than others, but there's certainly not one system that is much better than any, uh, any other. <clears throat> now, the main indication for spinal cord stimulation or for neuropathic pain are feedback surgery syndrome. This is, this is clearly the most frequent. Complex regional pain syndrome, polyneuropathy, and we'll talk about diabetic, toxic, and idiopathic um, and, uh, polyneuropathies. This is the first uh, randomized control study, uh, which is the process study, which actually looked at patients who had um, an, an, a spinal operation and uh, where they were randomized between um, having a stimulator or being followed by uh, conventional medical management. It was a large study, uh, you see 100 patients, 12, 12 centers in Europe, Australia, Canada, and Israel. And the, in, I, mean, I don't want to go into the details, but to cut the long story short, here is the result that you get at one month. Now, the primary outcome was a 50% decrease in the leg at, that, 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 at six months. So you see that at one month, if you have only medical management, which is the light uh, yellow bar, the effect is, is, is negligible. And it's much more pronounced if you have a spinal cord stimulator. Now, if you go along with time, well, at, at six months, about half of the patients with the stimulator are doing better, and only 9% of those with medical management are improving. Now, this shows that the um, that stimulation is probably better or more effective than uh, conventional medical management. The question is, is it also better than uh, surgery? And this is also a well-known study by Rick North and colleague who we looked at patients who had been operated on the back at one time, and they still had pain afterwards. So they came back, and they were randomized to either a, a redo surgery or spinal cord stimulation. Now, those who were, um, they, they had the option to cross over at six months. So those who were randomized to spinal cord stimulation tended not to go back. Only 20% of those required a, a second surgery. On the other hand, those who had surgery or were randomized to surgery at six months uh, required a spinal cord stimulation. This was considered to be highly significant. Incidentally, at three years, which is a further publication, patients who had been stimulated had a much better pain relief. About 40% of them had at least 50% pain relief against only 
of those who had been operated on. And they also took less opiates. 13% of the patients decreased their consumption against <coughs> about 70% uh, of patients who did actually increase their uh, opiate consumption. So compared to, spine, to, to surgical management, uh, spinal cord stimulation uh, was actually was also more uh, useful. Now, there was a study published in 2015 that was sort of revolutionary. Uh, it used uh, a system with 10 kilohertz, so that, that's 10, that's 10,000 uh, 10, uh, um, st uh, stimulation per second. Uh, in, and they looked at the, uh, the, the effect of pain or the low back. Here in green light is the low back, the, the, sorry, that is the low back, and that is uh, the, the vein. Now, that, that's very spectacular. This is an improvement that no other study has ever shown before. The problem is that there was some methodological problem with the study, and um, it's actually interesting to see that it has been redone uh, in, in Europe. Now, this group here did the same study with the same devices, and they, what they showed was that actually, if you look at the, the overall back and leg pain, whichever system you use, it's actually exactly similar. And, and, and there, is no, there, there is no such a, a huge effect. So we don't know exactly why that is, but certainly, there was some inbuilt bias in the in the in the study, which which is not to say that it was dishonest, but uh, it is always difficult to have a treatment to recommend a treatment that you cannot um, replicate the results of. So, to the health, uh, spinal cord uh, healthcare cost. Actually, there are a number of studies that show that over time uh, it is cost effective. Here is a, a study from Canada, who is al already uh, uh, rather old, but, but nevertheless, everybody would agree that in, in the order of uh, one to one and a half year, uh, you do have a cost neutrality. And after that, uh, having the stimulator is, is um, much more cost effective. That's of course uh, because of the implantation and the cost of the device is, is, is very high. Um, CRIPS, compl Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. Um, there is one very good study which was published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine on 54 patients. And they were followed in the uh, study for six months, but there has been a reappraisal two years and five years later. They looked at the pain, function, quality of life, and the global perceived effect. Just, this is just a summary at, at six months. And again, this was when the study, the, 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 how the study was designed. Uh, patients were randomized to either physical therapy, the pink bars, sorry, um, or the spinal cord stimulation and physical therapy, the red bars. Now, the important thing to realize here is that the analysis was an intention to treat analysis, which means that a number of patients who did not receive the stimulator because of various reasons, couldn't, uh, didn't uh, respond, whatever, were still included as if they would have received the, the stimulator. And despite that, you see that at one month and six months, there is a very clinically and, of course, statistically significant improvement. Now, if you... If you look at what happens, uh, what, the, 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 what the patient uh, uh, global impression of change is, uh, there is one with spinal cord, with, with physical therapy alone, 
that uh, thinks that it's worse ever, and, 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 and a few here are, are worse. But if you look at the, um, the, the overall, the ones that have been stimulated, the, the group that are either in change, improve, or much improved is about 80% of all of them. Now, there was a request, I think it was a request from the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine to uh, reestablish, to reanalyze, and to look at the data uh, five, five years later. And here is basically what I've showed you before. Again, this is VIS here, the pain score. Uh, pink is uh, physical therapy alone, red is uh, spinal cord plus physical therapy. And you see that uh, it, it does decrease significantly over two years. Now, af after two years, the effect seems to wane. What is, prob what is the, 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 the problem is that uh, the statistical significance is lost after three years. So the conclusion from the, this uh, paper is actually that uh, spinal cord stimulation relieves CRPS pain for three years, not more. But this is a bit uh, another way to look at it. If you look at, look at the patients who have actually had the treatment, those who were implanted, the ones in green, and not the ones that were uh, not implanted uh, and were ca counted as implanted because of the um, intention to treat analysis, then the picture is different. You see, you, you do still have a significant effect over the five years. So the global perceived effect clearly is uh, that more than 50% of the patients uh, estimate that they have been improved. About uh, those who were worsened, well, they were the predominantly patients who had not been treated by spinal cord stimulation, and a small proportion um, did, not, uh, did not change. If you ask the questions, would you do it again? The answer was overwhelmingly, 95% of the patient implanted said yes, I would do it again. Now, <clears throat> what that day, day shows is that after three years, uh, there is no statistical difference in uh, VAS. Uh, well, uh, you can accept that. However, what the critic will remember is that Spinal cord stimulation does not work in uh, complex region pain syndrome. And what the payers will understand is uh, CRISP is not effective. It's not a good indication. So don't fund it. And I would suggest you read a fantastic article that was written by Dan Carr, was published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the title is When Bad Evidence Happens to Good Treatment. To good treatment. And this is really related to the, the fallacy of uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, if you look at the uh, pain score from a, a, a number of studies, uh, you still see that uh, there is a, a clear predominance uh, preference for spinal cord simulation as opposed to uh, not no, 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 to conventional medical treatment. And here again, the cost saving curve for, um, for CRIPS, uh, not for uh, low back pain now, but you see, uh, you are in the order of uh, the order of one year, or, or sorry, two to three years. Uh, but it it has been cost effective enough for Nice to recommend the treatment, and the cost per quality 
uh, which is which is the measurement that is used to decide whether you're going to fund the treatment or not, is in the order of 22,000 euros. And, and the limit in Western countries to decide for the, the funding of a treatment is around 30,000 euros. So it's well below the accepted uh, margin. Let's look at the diabetic neuropathy, the painful direct neuropathy. Now, painful direct neuropathy should not, should not respond to spinal cord stimulation because you have, um, uh, you have um, abnormal sensation. And because of that, uh, you may not have a good response. But nevertheless, uh, since 1996 already, the first study showed that in 10 patients who were unresponsive to conventional therapy, uh, the stimulation actually improved. And, and this was a blinded, blinded trial, admittedly only 10 patients, but nevertheless blinded. And you, you would see that about 50%, uh, eight, of, eight, eight out of 10 patients had a 50% pain relief. And, and the pain relief lasted. This, and in red, you have what happens at three months. And then, so the, the, uh, the improvement is here, placebo, baseline, peak pain. And the same thing up to six months. So clearly, you, you do have a subpopulation of patients, some of whom do have significant uh, neurological deficits in terms of sensation, who still respond to spinal cord simulation. Uh, same, uh, same thing here, uh, again, 10 patients. What they took is those who had a positive trial. There was one late failure and three patients died. They looked at 3.3 years and they looked at two things. The pain before the, 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 with stimulation off or with stimulation on. So the background, with stimulation off, the background, stimulation on. At three years, six patients, you see there's a clear decrease. Now, if you look at the peak pain, stimulation off or peak pain, stimulation on, again, there is a very significant decrease. If you don't look at, at, at uh, three years, but at 7.5 years, the same patients, background pain of stim off, high pain, stim on, no pain. Same thing with peak, uh, with the peak pain. So again, the, the spinal cord stimulation definitely has a, a, a beneficial effect in uh, those situations. It also increases, and I'll show you that in a slide in a second. It, it also increases the exercise threshold. So people are more able to move and walk. We, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the, the, there is still a problem, and, and this problem is that it is true that the statistical and clinical significance of pain relief is maintained. However, uh, the success rate over five years um, is decreasing. Now, the fact that it is, it is decreasing doesn't change the fact that people, that 80% of the people, despite all of this, here you see this um, efficacy decrease, 80% of the people would uh, opt to uh, replace their stimulator once it's been, um, um, once the battery is, is, is low. Which means that even though uh, it's not a complete pain relief, patients do benefit significantly from the, the, the therapy. Here is one of the randomized multi-center study uh, that looked at pain, uh, the, the quality of life and pain 
Uh, you see at one month, three months, and six months, uh, there is a substantial decrease and the quality of life here is substantially increased. And this is uh, a, a well-designed, well uh, randomized study uh, of a reasonable number of patients, about uh, 60 patients. Here again, um, looking at the pain at daytime, and you know that uh, people um, with diabetes have a lot of uh, pain at night, and at, three, at uh, baseline three and six months, the pain at night, the pain during the day, both of them actually decreased significantly. So if you compare the success rate of spinal cord stimulation uh, to best medical treatment down here, uh, about 60% of patients respond to spinal cord stimulation and le less than 10% will do so to the best medical treatment. The long-term follow-up is, uh, this is a subset of another study. Here we are looking at uh, five uh, years, 5.3 years, uh, but a mean duration of neuropathy, well, with neuropathy, these patients have deficits of, of over 10 years. Um, see, that there is a, a, a maintained effect at 36 months um, for the daytime pain, as well as the quality of life in green here. Over time, this is three, 36 months, three years, it, it actually um, the, the benefit has in, is maintained. This is just to show that uh, this is a summary of uh, all sorts of different modulation uh, modalities uh, for, of various, uh, various size of study and number of patients, and they all show that the trend is significantly decreasing over time with pa when patients are stimulated. Now, the glitch in all this is that contrary to what happens with uh, low back pain and um, complex region pain syndrome, it shows that the cost effectiveness of spinal cord stimulation for the diabetic pain and uh, neuropathy is not obtained. The societal cost, the quality adjusted life years, et cetera, et cetera, just all show that it is not cost effective um, with a cost per quality that's nearly 100,000 euros. Now, the problem here is that the studies we have are, are limited. The number of, of properly controlled studies is limited. The number of patients that have been studied is rather low. We expect that <coughs> this will change, particularly when the follow-up will be longer. Obviously, you're not going to have a uh, cost-effective treatment if you stop your analysis at the six months because the cost of investment of the, uh, of the equipment and the operation is going to be much, much too high. Nevertheless, uh, NICE, which is the UK uh, um, institution that uh, is very influential in Europe, uh, has... Uh, accepted the treatment for the, the spinal cord stimulation treatment for neuropathic pain, assuming the pain is, the pain is a chronic and severe, and patients are assessed by an experienced multidisciplinary team, and they have a successful um, stimulation trial. The ischemic pain, which is only partially neuropathic, is not yet uh, accepted. Now, I told you before that uh, spinal cord stimulation may improve the 
physical activity. Here, we have uh, a study on only 20 patients, which we did uh, about uh, 10 years, 20 years ago, with uh, a number of uh, sensors here. And those sensors will allow you to diagnose the position of the patient, whether lying, standing, walking, or, or bending. And if you look at that, we look at 12 months, we lost a few patients over time, but you see that in proportion of change, their walking ability increased considerably. They, they spend more time standing and walking, about 50%, less lying, and their VA score decreased. Well, that's not really surprising. The other thing is that the speed of their walk and as well as the stride length actually uh, increased, uh, the variability of the stride length decreased, and the, 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 the speed decreased. Now, this looks very great, but remember, this is a percentage of change. So if you do have a benefit of 20% or 100%, 100% of nothing is still not very much. So before, before we, we really uh, accept those results, we have to quantify them in, in absolute numbers, not percentage changes. Now, how do you select patients for spinal cord stimulation? Well, you need a diagnostic, neuropathic or ischemic pain. Uh, obviously, you, can, uh, you should avoid patients with uh, multiple sites of pain. You can't stimulate the whole body, although you could, but, but it, this, is not, this is not something that is clinically uh, applicable. You should, those patients should not respond to conservative therapy. <clears throat> No unmanaged psychological issues, uh, no substance depends, uh, abuse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you should probably try trial them. Although uh, there is a recent publication uh, by, uh, by um, some, there is some somebody has turned on the microphone. Okay, by some who who showed that. Uh, you know, this is not necessarily the case. You might be able to implant patients without um, uh, testing them and it still be very cost effective. Um, now, there is a tool if you're interested in, uh, this is the address uh, to help you uh, select patients for the uh, spinal cord stimulation, and this is uh, an address that is uh, free of charge. Now, obviously, well, you want to avoid patients who are psychologically unstable, um, and this is usually a very difficult diagnosis to make, unless uh, the things are very clear. So the, the principle, and, and I'm... Um, uh, I've been given this slide by Raymond Chadwick, who's a psychologist at Millsgrove, uh, James Cook Hospital. And what it shows is that you, know, you have different personalities, and there's no one personality that would really go and fit into a, a, a particular spot. You know, you, if you start looking for this one or this one that would fit exactly, <coughs> you'll end up with a problem. That simply doesn't work. What you want to is avoid people who should not be implanted. So if somebody has a real problem, whether psychological, organic, or whatever, that's a red. Do not do any invasive treatment. If you end up with a more, a more nuanced uh, judgment like, uh, you know, you can implant the patient, but psychological sessions <coughs> will be needed before and after the intervention, whether you do it or not. And then there are those who are clear indications and it's just a go ahead, yes, implant. <coughs> 
these techniques then do have complications. They may be related to the hardware, the lead, they migrate, they tend not to migrate anymore as much as they did before because the technology has improved. Um, the malfunction, about 10% of all uh, problems are uh, fracture or malfunction of the leads. Battery failure are much more rare. Uh, biological complication, this is the implant site uh, pain. Up to 31%, this is rather high, but, but this is something that has been reported. And sometimes requires explantation of the system because patient can't uh, tolerate that pain. Infection, 2 to 3%, but uh, was higher in earlier series. And obviously, um, the, the, the uh, risk factors uh, are diabetes, obesity, and smoking. However, uh, a series uh, by Falowski showed that this may not be the case. Neuropuncture, neurological injury, uh, they do happen. They are, however, more common with also root ganglion stimulation, which is a technique that's been um, developed recently. But it's not too much of a problem uh, to the extent that the government in Denmark has stopped reimbursing the therapy. So in conclusion, spinal cord stimulation, neuropathic pain, uh, if you compare it to best medical treatment, it is effective, provides a, a meaningful uh, pain relief in failed back surgery syndrome, in complex regional pain syndrome, as well as in diabetic neuropathy. It improved the quality of life, cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness is established for failed back surgery syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome. It may, my experience is it will, but it, uh, the, the data show that it may improve vascular impairment and the complication, although often may minor, um, are up to 40%. Hardware is more common than biological, and serious complicated neurological damages are extremely rare. So spinal cord simulation is safe and effective. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Eric. It is a very exhilarating uh, presentation. And the thing is, SCS is, is a foreign thing to us. And by listening to your talk, it made us know that there are options for the three diagnoses, the failed back surgery syndrome, the CRPS, and the diabetic neuropathy. There are options for those diagnoses that we can uh, choose for the patients. And although I'm not sure it is currently available in Indonesia, but uh, Someda has all in their early uh, presentation, they already said that they'll distribute this device, but uh, we'll, we'll going to see in the near future. And let's, we'll still have probably just five minutes for a Q&A and Dr. Erhan has already answered uh, quite a few questions and it was very long and clear so that I, I'm, I feel like I'm watching another lecture in your key answer. <laughs> and, and I think most of them are true and you're, you're still typing. I, I salute you for that. And the question from Professor Eric, I think uh, it's already been answered in your slides, the side effect of spinal cord stimulation, uh, the biological is mostly mechanical, and how we, we suggest any SGS. Now, in your personal opinion, uh, how would you suggest the SGS? I mean, uh, if it was a surgery, uh, people might op ex openly accept that, but it is not a surgery. It's a minimal invasive thing, and it will cost quite a lot. And it is not, and it. I don't think it will be uh, uh, 
guaranteed by the national insurance anytime soon, but uh, it is it will be costly. How would you uh, uh, recommend it or uh, considering it as an option of treatment for your patients uh, yeah. this far? Well, you see, the, the, the important thing is that, uh, well, admittedly, it is expensive if you implant the whole system. Now, if you only implant the electrodes and test it before you implant it, which is the currently accepted way to do it, uh, it's much less expensive. Now, independently from the expense, the operation is never guaranteed. Yes. All right? Now, you do an operation, and then things turn out sour. You are not improved or even worse than before. So what do you do? You can't, you can't unscrumble the eggs. You can't come back, all yeah. right? So yeah. that's the big advantage of spinal cord stimulation. If, you, if it is not effective, you will retrieve the electrodes and you haven't changed the anatomy. Now, admittedly, this is, this is more expensive initially, but if you consider the cost of an operation that is not entirely successful and the medication that's ensuring and all the rest of it, I'm not sure that uh, spinal cord stimulation is going to be more expensive. As a matter of fact, every study that has looked at this, although you could, you could argue about the quality of those studies, but every study that looked at this it has shown that uh, spinal cord stimulation is uh, effective and, and, and cost effective. Thank you, sir. And, and other than that, the next question is, is only the visual analog score will be the standard of satisfaction in your patients? Or are you uh, recommending something else like a functional index? Or did you do another background check for this patient for, so that if he or she is satisfied, uh, he may not feel a uh, less degree of fast, but he he might be able to function. I don't know. Uh, are anything that you might suggest to your patients before uh, giving this uh, SGS? No, you're right. Um, the the visual analog score is just one way to look at the problem. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is essentially a clinical decision to decide whether you are going to go ahead or not. Now, the percentage of improvement is one thing, but, uh, you know, things like uh, improved sleep quality, like uh, patients saying, uh, you know, it's, um, it, it does help me. I had a patient. I had a patient the other day who said, "The you know I'm um, the improvement is about thirty percent." So I said, "Look, thirty percent is not enough." But he said, "Hey, thirty mm. percent is the best I ever had." So what what do you say? So really, it's a clinical decision. Yeah. Uh, you have to decide uh, on on a partnership sort of. Uh, uh, decision with your patient whether you're going to go ahead whether or not. But again, even if you do go ahead expenses apart, there is no known uh, serious deleterious effect. It is essentially a reversible therapy. Yes, understood. Thank you, sir. And last for Dr. Erhan. I think I believe you have answered everything here. Yeah. <laughs> I have no um, no further. Do uh, uh, of, there's, is there anything that you want to answer live? Uh -huh. Well, uh, most of the questions were regarding the intravenous use of uh, lidocaine. Uh, there, I uh, wrote about the uh, bolus doses and infusion. Yeah. Uh, usually lidocaine is preferred uh, during the perioperative period, but in studies, we're using ketamine. 
the uh, b the studies which showed uh, beneficial results uh, used uh, till 24 hours postoperatively. Uh, so it's uh, recommended uh, like that. Uh, and uh, ketamine can be uh, combined to uh, everyday uh, anesthesia practice. Uh, it it can be used as a multimodal analgesic therapeutic option. So uh, you can combine it with PCA morphine or you can do it uh, with uh, other uh, peripheral blocks. So uh, you, it's, it's a multimodal uh, balanced analgesia. Uh, so uh, the uh, participants can all read uh, to the suggested doses and the intervals. And uh, there was a question about uh, post mastectomy, uh, chronic mm -hmm, pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, we first uh, we know that uh, 70 to 90 percent of the chronic uh, neuropathic pain patients can benefit from medical therapy, and uh, as I had written, uh, antidepressants and anticonvulsants are the first line drugs, and opioids are uh, uh, used whenever uh, as a, a second line uh, drug. Uh, and uh, there are some, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, there are some uh, few uh, pilot studies uh, showing the effectiveness of peripheral nerve blocks lasting to one week pain relief. Uh, as uh, Dr. Eric uh, has also mentioned, uh, spinal cord stimulation is uh, for uh, especially uh, helpful for neuropathic pain. And since uh, chronic post-surgical pain, uh, if it's very severe, the neuropathic component is very uh, dominant. So uh, considering the neuropathic nature of the chronic post-surgical pain, uh, those um, sophisticated methods can be reserved for very intractable uh, cases. Okay. And uh, there was also one uh, question about cognitive therapy. Uh, well, yes. uh, I was writing it, uh, I was about to complete it, but uh, to treat <laughs> uh, chronic pain, uh, we don't use just cognitive uh, therapy as a soul. Uh, we should also always combine it with other uh, modalities. And uh, so uh, this includes medication, uh, physical therapy, uh, other modalities. And uh, the cognitive therapy is a, a kind of per pain perception technique. Uh, I will uh, write in detail to the okay. comments. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Professor Eric, Dr. Erhan for your very helpful and insightful talk this afternoon. It's currently raining in Jakarta, and sorry if I talk that loud, but I'm trying to uh, hear the rain. And thank you for everybody who is listening and watching the session. And I think we're going to conclude this session. So I'm not going to give you any more conclusion because uh, mm -hmm. what has been given for us is very uh, it's so much. And now we're going to see the band playing again. <laughs> I think Dr. Susilo is eagerly waiting. <laughs> and we would like to thank you, Dr. Eric Busher and Dr. Erhan and Dr. Christine as well for the opportunity for us to study from them. And see you again, hopefully, and stay thank safe you. for everybody. And thank you hopefully we can see you again next year. In person. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you all. Much. And thank you for all the sponsors as well. In okay, thank you. Thank you. Greetings and best wishes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Mono, Elfan, uh, Professor Busser, Dr. Christian Engelhardt. Thank you for your uh, insightful uh, presentation. It's really comprehensive. We really learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to mention the sponsors for uh, this session is uh, Sona, Green Medica, and Deepa. Thank you for your support. And as uh, Dr. Mono already mentioned, 3 o'clock, this is our last, oh, so sad. This mm. is our final uh, musical performance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> next year. Hopefully next year. Hopefully yes. next year we will the offline meetings. Uh, yes. Fun, Professor Buser. I think uh, it will be great to see you guys uh, back in Jakarta. 
and yes. we will Hope to see you too. Yes. <laughs> yes, so stay safe, stay healthy, and let's stay the movie.